All right, good morning. So um, I'm ta today is about Abraham part two, because I realized that last week I did not really tell the story of Abraham, and I want to tell that because I think that's really important uh, for us uh, with regards to how, uh, how we build, how we cultivate our own faith. So as I said last week, in Judaism, Abraham is uh, the founding father of the covenant. In Christianity, he is the model for all who believe. And in Islam, he is the link in the chain of prophets that begins with Adam and ends with Muhammad. So Abraham marries Sarai. So at this point, his name is Abram, but I confuse that all the time. So Abraham marries Sarai, uh, who is barren, okay? And there's a famine. Barren and a famine. It's not a good week. And, uh, and so they travel to Egypt. People always go to Egypt when there's a famine because of the river Nile uh, that overflows her banks. Uh, it's a very fertile place. So there's usually food in Egypt, you know. Uh, so Abraham tells Sarai that when we get there, you should say that you're my sister. Because otherwise it could go really badly for me. And they'll probably kill me so they can have you. And so Pharaoh's officials praise Sarai for her beauty, and they cart her off to the harem. And uh, she goes to the palace, and, and in, in exchange for his sister, Abraham is given livestock and servants. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just really struck me as funny. This sort of thing. I can imagine telling my sister, well, I'm sorry, I'm surrendering you to the Pharaoh's harem, but hey, the good news is I'm going to get livestock and servants, you know, just... And so what happens in the story is that God afflicts Pharaoh and his household with plagues, uh, for which Pharaoh really is trying to understand the reason. And so upon discovering that Sarai is married, Pharaoh demands that, sh uh, that they leave, that she and Abraham leave, and take all of their stuff, their, their newfound livestock and servants, take it all with you. So God comes to Abraham in a vision and repeats the promise of land and descendants. So Abraham and God have a covenant. Abraham and Sarai don't know how Abraham is going to become the father of a great nation. Uh, they still have no children. So, you know, when I, when I think of these big, long Bible epic stories, I think it's really helpful to cast them in your mind's eye so that we have a better picture of these things. So... Let's just say that Abraham is Brad Pitt, okay? Sarah is Angelina, okay? And now we're coming up to the really interesting part. There is a slave girl who will be played by Jennifer Aniston, okay? I mean, just, it'll help you have an image. It helps have an image in your mind when we, when we talk about the story, right? So... Humanly, this promise that Abraham is going to be the father of a great nation seems impossible because it looks like there's no, you know, and sometimes it, this is applicable to us because it looks like sometimes there's no way, I just can't see how my prayer could possibly be answered here, right? You know, so, so, but the thing is, we, bless you, we see with a limited vision, right? And this is the wisdom of new thought. To say, you know, don't look exclusively with your five senses. There is an infinite invisible realm that is actually more true and more real than what we see with just our physical eyes and our five senses. So, um, Sarah, Angelina, offers Abraham, Brad, her slave girl. Okay. And... Um, so Abraham and Hagar, the slave girl, Jennifer, they go off, and, uh, and this was with the intention that she would bear him a son. Um, so what I thought was interesting about this this time in my read-through was that often we try to force our good, and when we do, there is often trouble. You know, that what we should do, rather than try to force it, is to rest and be patient and in science of mind, we would say, you know, we need to be in the knowing that it's already done. So Hagar finds out that she is pregnant. This is the slave girl. And she begins to despise her mistress. See, the story gets good, doesn't it? It's a great story. This is like more than a miniseries. This is really true. And so um, 
Sarai mistreats the slave girl and Hagar flees, but an angel stops Hagar and says, return. Your son is going to be, forgive me, a badass. But he says, that's basically what the angel says, that your son is going to be tough stuff, and you're going to call him Ishmael. So Abraham is 86 years old when Ishmael is born. 13 years later, Abraham, 99 years old, God declares that his new name is Abraham, from Abram to Abraham, and he will be the father of many nations. So Abraham received the instructions for the covenant, and the sign would be circumcision, and Sarai will now be called Sarah. And again, God promises Abraham a son by Sarah. And Abraham laughs. He says, you know, I'm 100. She's 90. Are you kidding? Really? Really? So one day, Abraham is sitting at the opening of his tent. Now, don't think like a little pup tent. Think like a big caravan kind of tent. Abraham is sitting at the entrance to his tent, and he sees three men. It says, three men in the presence of God. So he bows and welcomes them and brings them hospitality. And one of the visitors tells Abraham that next year, Sarah is going to give him a son. Now, she overhears this, and she laughs, right? And the guest asks Abraham, you know, why is she laughing? Is, is, you know, is there anything that's too hard for God? And so Sarah, in fact, becomes pregnant, and she bears a son, Isaac. Now, Ishmael, the son from the slave girl, is 14 years old. And in that way that brothers have of doing things, he just loves to mock his younger brother, the newborn, right, the, the little one. So Sarah tells Abraham, you know, you've got to get rid of these people. You know, they're really cramping our son's style. You know, so Hagar, send Hagar and uh, Ishmael away, and, because Sarah declares that Ishmael will not share in Isaac's inheritance. Now, this distresses Abraham, and he seeks God's guidance, but God says, you know, do what your wife wants here, because both Isaac, your new son, and Ishmael, the son with the slave girl, are going to give you lots and lots of descendants. So, off go Ishmael and Hagar, they get sent away. Now, at some point in Isaac's youth, Abraham is commanded by God to offer Isaac up as a sacrifice. So imagine waiting all these years, they finally have the son, and now God says, by the way, I'd like you to sacrifice him to me. So at some times, it seems we are asked, I think, to give up the thing that means the most to us. At least that's what it looks like. So Abraham and Isaac are going up the mountain, father and son, you know, Isaac thinks they're going on a nice little hike. He doesn't know. <laughs> He's carrying the wood <laughs> yeah, for his own sacrifice. He says, where's, where's the animal for the, for the burnt offering, Dad? And Abram says, oh, God's going to provide a lamb. So just as Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, the angel of the Lord stops him, and there's a ram caught in, in, in the bushes there, and he sacrifices the ram. So part of this is that obedience is the foundation of faith. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. That Abraham believed what God told him to do was for the best, no matter what the appearance was. This is for your highest good, no matter how it looks. Mm, God, that's hard, isn't it? Sometimes that is so, so difficult. But for his obedience, Abraham has promised more descendants and an abundance of property. No, story, uh, story goes on, Sarah dies, Abraham takes a new wife, yet again. Uh, he's, he, uh, he's, he has, he, yet again, he has more sons, this time six more sons. And Abraham lives to see Isaac marry Rebekah. Abraham dies at 175 years old. Huh? All right. Now, Abraham has been obedient to the divine and has great faith in God's grace. So this faith is why God chooses him for the covenant, and the covenant, the covenant is one of faith. So this is what Ernest Holmes says. He says that prayer, faith, and belief are related mental attitudes. You know, you cannot have faith in one thing but believe something else. You know, you can't pray in one way but then say, oh, this is never going to work. I don't know why I'm bothering. I don't know why I'm taking the time to pray. It's probably not going to happen. Because one cancels out the other. 
He says that the man who has faith in his own ability accomplishes far more than the one who has no confidence in himself. And so now, now Abraham had faith in God's ability. So that those who have great faith have great power. So why is one person's prayer, because people ask this all the time, why is one person's prayer answered while another looks like it remains unanswered? And so Ernest is very clear. He says it cannot be that God desires more good for one person than for another. So God looks at all of us and desires great good for everybody. Everybody, because God's infinite. You know, it's not like the good's going to run out. And so people receive, though, because of their belief, not because of what they believe in, because of their actual belief. And I think that's really interesting to look at and say, well, what, what do I believe? Do I believe that God is for me? Do I believe that the universe is for me? Do I believe that life is for me? Or do I think it's all an exhale, ba- uh, up- exhale, exhale, an uphill battle? You know, and I've got to fight for everything, everything that I get. People receive because of their belief. I can't tell you how often people will say to me after church or after a class, they'll say, well, I know so-and-so, and they're, they're a terrible person. They're a snake. I know them. You know, they're a liar and a cheat. They cheat on their taxes, this, that, and the other thing. They just go on and on and on about it. Say, I don't know why their life looks so good. Why is their life so good? They're so terrible. Why does God continue to bless them like that? And I said, people have what they have because it's their consciousness. They believe that they can have whatever it is they currently have, as we all do. We have right now in our life what we believe we can have. Like, for example, our health today is a demonstration of what we believe our health can be right now. You know, you say, well, I, you know, that, 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 my age, this, that. No, no, no. No, we have what we have because of our belief. And other people have what they have in their experience of life because of their belief. So the smart thing would be to not focus so much on why this person is a snake in the grass and they have so much. The important thing to focus on would be, how can I increase my belief? How can I build my faith in a greater way so that I could have greater healing in my body and greater healing in my relationships and, you know, more doubloons in my bank account, right? All of those things because people receive because of their belief, not because of what they believe in. You know, there are lots of wonderful, kind people who believe in God and a lot in their life is really challenging. We know these people. We may have been them. We may be them. Right? So people can say, oh, but I believe in God. I don't know why these horrible things continue to happen. But it's because of your belief, not what you believe in. Do you see the distinction? Right? So faith is an affirmative mental approach to, to, to life, to, to our reality. So the principle governing faith, Ernest Holmes teaches us, is that when the one praying, that's you and I, we're the ones who are praying, And I imagine that Abraham and Sarah prayed a lot. You know, think about it. They didn't have the internet. They had no TV. They didn't have a radio, no boombox, nothing like that. You know, so what are we going to do? Well, I guess we may as well pray, right? What else are we going to do? So, but, but I mean, I believe these are people who really had faith. So the principle governing faith is that when the person praying becomes convinced, right? When we become convinced, our prayer will automatically be answered when we're convinced. And so Jesus gives this teaching in the New Testament that it's done unto you as you believe. So all those horrible people that we know who are doing so well, it's done unto them as they believe. It's not done unto them as you believe. Right? It's done unto them as they believe. Right? So we become conscious, Ernest says, we become conscious of darkness only when we are without faith. So I think that's really interesting. Because when I think the darkness looms really large, what I have to check in with with myself is, wow, where's my faith here? What am I having faith in? You know, I see some appearance in the newspaper or on TV, and it starts to get me riled up, and I have to say, wait, wait, what am I having faith in here? Am I believing in the darkness, or am I believing in the light? Am I believing in truth, or am I believing in appearances? You know, do I know God is greater than this, or do I think this that's happening in the world out here is actually bigger than God? You know, and, and so that for me is sort of my, my self-correct. It gets me back on track. Right? So to have faith, we have to have a conviction. And this is fundamental to our teaching in the science of mind, that all is well. That's not denial. 
That's not denial. We're not saying everything is perfect out here in the world because God knows there's a lot that needs to be changed for better in the world. But on the inside, on the spiritual plane, in the invisible realm, everything is absolutely fine. It's perfect. See, because my belief in goodness, your belief in goodness, has to be greater than the appearance that we see in the world. Right? And there will always be appearances to the contrary in the world. I just think that that's so, because there are always people who are evolving in consciousness. So to keep faith, nothing can weaken that conviction. Because I think faith, again, is built up from belief and acceptance and trust. Now, I think we do this particularly well in the science of mind because we always want people to practice. We want people to engage in a spiritual practice. We want you to meditate. When you meditate, you're building your faith. When you pray, you're building your faith. When you affirm, you're building your faith. You know, when you study the word of truth, you're building your faith. So, in the New Testament, the centurion comes to Jesus and ask Jesus to heal his servant. And Jesus says, go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto you. As you believe, so that's what you're going to get. And so, of course, the centurion goes home and the servant is healed. So growing up, there was a little uh, story in our family. I have a, an aunt, my mother's older sister. She was my godmother growing up. And she was a very, very devout woman. Uh, went to church all the time, and the whole thing. You know, she had, um... <sighs> have I said anything to offend anybody yet? <laughs> it could be time. So, so now I have one of these. I have one of these in my backyard myself, so, so I'm not telling tales on anybody. But she had like the Mary on the half shell in the backyard, you know? <laughs> and, and, she was, and she was very, very devoted. So I remember, I remember this story in my youth that, the priest, from, the priest from our church, uh, Father Kelly, who was a, a terrific guy, uh, he, came to, he would go and visit my aunt, and they would have coffee and blah, blah, blah. And one day he said to her, he said, would you pray for me? Because he knew she was a very devout person. She had a lot, a lot of faith. And she said to him, God, I can't believe She said, are you serious? And he said, well, of course I'm serious. I want you to pray for me. I have a physical problem, and... And she said, okay. She said, I'll pray for you, but only if you're really serious, because I want you to know there has never been a time when I have prayed, and now for her, it was all about Mary. She said, there has never been a time when I have prayed, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, has not responded, has not answered my prayer. So if you're serious, I'll pray for you. And he was like, okay, okay. <laughs> the next day, he came back, knocked on the door, and Aunt Helen opens the door, and he says, I've got good news. Your prayer was answered. And she says, I know that. <laughs> so, so, you know, this is the level of faith that I think we actually aspire to. You know, this is, now, now I know that Father Kelly was praying and praying and praying, but you know, there really is something powerful about coming into agreement with someone for a greater truth to be revealed. And, 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 and so for him, that agreement was with Anne Helen because Anne Helen had really great faith. She really did. And to, and to this day, she still really, really does. So whatever, whatever appearances may be, I think we have to hold to God is good and God is all. God is good and God is all. God is good, God is all. And I know that the world of appearances will challenge us again and again and again to believe something else. And so here is the wisdom, the real brilliance of new thought, is will I, will you be guided by outer appearances? Will that dictate our life, how happy we can be, what our level of experience could be, what our level of expression could be in life? Will we be guided exclusively by externals or will we know an inner spiritual truth? Will we rely on something that's invisible, something spiritual that we teach is actually greater because, it, because in fact, it is the infinite itself? Will, will we rely on that? See, this is why I think it's so great about new thought, that up until, up until the advent of new thought, really, our church is a new thought church, people were exclusively guided by appearances. You know, it was only what was going on out here 
It was what told people how well they were doing or if they were doing okay or if things were going to be good for them or better or worse. So Abraham represents faith, the beginning of faith that's willing to follow the guidance of God. Now, I believe that we are all being given guidance all the time. Right? And so we have, we have faith. As students of science of mind, we're continuing to build our faith through, through prayer and meditation and study and, and this other piece of knowing beyond appearances a greater spiritual truth, affirming beyond what we see that there is something greater taking place, affirming beyond the condition in front of us that, that God desires only good for each of us. So that's the story of Abraham. Let's pray. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment to just remember that we are surrounded and filled with God's spirit. God's infinite love and light is the truth about each and every one of us. And I also know that we're all connected on the unseen side of life, that in the mind and in the heart of God, there's only one, and it is all of us together. And so in this awareness, I speak the word for each and every one of us that like Abraham, we are expanding, deepening, evolving our own faith that we have faith in the principle and the power and the presence of God that is, in fact, everywhere, but also right within our very being. That, in fact, God within us is the most true, most real thing about us. And so I speak the word for us that whatever looks like, gosh, that's just impossible in our life. I don't know how that could ever happen. We remember that with God, all things are possible. And I claim this is true for each and every one of us today, that our faith is deepened and we are expanded in consciousness and our belief, what we believe is available to us, is possible for us, is absolutely enlarged in this moment. That we have a greater acceptance and receptivity than we've ever known before. So we include in our prayer today our family members and our friends and loved ones. We see them in our mind's eye and we, we wrap our spiritual arms of love around them and we hold them high in consciousness. We, we let our prayer be a blessing in the world around us. So all of those appearances that pull for our attention, we say God is in the midst of that. God is there as love. God is present as peace, as healing, as right action. God is on the job. We bless our church. We bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we're blessed by being together, that we all get raised up today that there is a healing available for each and every one of us, and we say yes to it. And so with a full heart, I give thanks and release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, Amen. <laughs>